Let's review some of the armor that we've seen from House of the Dragon, the new Game of Thrones series. I'm Matt Easton, a scholar gladiator. I'm an arms and armor expert and I teach people how to sword fight. And with the new HBO series House of the Dragon coming later this month, it seems like the perfect opportunity to have a look at some of the armor that we can see in the trailer and some of the other teasers that we've got as well. First thing to say, of course, is that the original Game of Thrones series established a very characteristic look which we see replicated here to some degree although of course this series is a massive prequel it's set a long long time before and the original series did some things absolutely fantastically and it has to be said some things not so well so let's have a look and see we're going to look at specifically the armor rather than the weapons specifically the armor that we've seen in the trailer now as an arms and armor expert aficionado whatever you want to call me one of the things that i noticed when i first saw the trailer and all of the kind of preview bits of the trailer the, the little uh, teasers that we were getting fed was that there isn't necessarily a sign of evolution or development in the equipment so despite the fact that this is set a long long time in the past hundreds of years in in the past we don't really see a big difference in the technological level of the armor now from a historical point of view this is a little bit weird because if the original game of thrones series was set in let's say the equivalent to the 16th century on earth um, then if we go back to say the 12th century we wouldn't see the same arms and armor we would see armor looking somewhat differently because humans tend to learn from experience develop new technologies and they develop and advance the armor as they go along. So 14th century armor doesn't look the same as 17th century armor. However, what we see here fundamentally looks like the same technological level, and that is predominantly plate armor. I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the armor as we go along, of course. And so this is equivalent to, if we d deal with real earth history, this is equivalent to really the 15th and 16th centuries. Now there are several prominent characters that we've seen so far, um, but the first ones that I'm going to see are the King's Guard. So looking at the King's Guard's armour, you can see that it is different um, to what's seen in the Westeros that we know from the previous series. But that being said, we know that the armour would have developed, it would have changed design a bit, certainly decoration. It would have worn out and had to be replaced and probably each ruler would try and stamp their own uh, mark on what their king's guard looked like but overall it has some marked similarities to the king's guard that went before they have open-faced helmets um, with a sort of bar boot or almost kind of um, hop light helmet shape to the front of them they have large pauldrons they have breastplates uh, they have similar coloration as well they're kind of silver and gold theme however the breastplates are different they're a different design we've got this kind of chevron design on these new ones and they, they are very large pauldrons. Now, while we had large pauldrons previously, these are even bigger pauldrons. And this is actually a theme I've noticed on the new armor in the new series, House of the Dragon. Now, one of the issues with large pauldrons like this, if they're not articulated, is they basically form a bridge between your upper arm and your neck. Now, if you have these halt guards or kind of vertical elements here, which protect against things coming underneath the edge of the helmet, that accentuates this issue as well. Now why is it an issue? Well quite simply, if you have a large unarticulated plate here, usually um, attached via a strap or um, a, t a lace known as a point at the top here, when you lift your arm you get to a certain point where the plate gets stuck between the arm and the side of your helmet or the side of your head if you're not wearing a helmet. It quite hurts if you're not wearing a helmet. And so it limits your mobility of your arm a lot and we actually kind of get a hint of this when we see some of the movements of people in Game of Thrones that have large pauldrons because they lift their arms to here and they can't lift them any further because they get jammed between the arm and the head. If we look at the old King's Guard, the pauldrons, as they're called, were slightly smaller and so this wouldn't be such an issue. The bigger the pauldrons, the bigger the problem. How do people get over this in period? Two main ways. They either wore smaller spaulders that were attached at the point of the shoulder so they don't collide with the head, or they wore large pauldrons that had articulations to them or were designed in such a way that you could still get a fair amount of mobility up to about that level, which means that you can more accurately or more uh, deftly, should we say, use things like pole axes swinging them over the head. If you've got large pauldrons that lock against the head like this, it means that you can't use weapons very easily. Obviously, you could use the couch lance on horseback, but you can't, for example, take a two-handed weapon and lift it above your head because the pauldrons will collide with the side of your head. So I think there's an issue here with the costumier is not necessarily necessarily fully understanding how armor works 
they know how it looks and so they've copied it they've given them the large pauldrons because they think it looks cool but then i suspect that the uh, actors and extras have uh, encountered problems in use but we'll see as the show goes on now i'm not going to be overly critical because the king's guard wearing armor in the court in the presence of the king most of the time has a ceremonial purpose. They're not necessarily preparing to go for war, but there are some very unprotected areas. There are three main things which really hit me with these king king's guards. First of all, their crotches. <laughs> their groins are not very well protected. They don't have a mail, aka chainmail skirt or um, uh, scale armor skirt or anything like that. They don't have a fold, as it's called, that is overlapping lames of plate coming down from their breastplate to protect their crotches, their groins. So their groins and upper legs look somewhat unprotected. The other element to mention is that plate armor usually has gaps in it, always has gaps in it, and the gaps are usually filled by something else, usually mail, aka chainmail. Now in this case, there is no chainmail to be seen. So there's none at the neck, there's none at the armpits, there's none at the, the waist or the, the crotch. So there's nothing filling the gaps between the plates. They're literally only covered where there are plates. And one of the big, big problems here is they don't seem to be wearing elbow armor. Now, as someone who's massively interested in armor and studies period manuscripts uh, on the subject and originals in museums and everything else, this is rather odd. It's rather odd to have forearm defense, an upper arm defense, and nothing on your elbow. Because very often, actually, anyone who's played sports, even if you've done like skateboarding as a kid or you've done hockey or something like this, one of the things that most often needs to be protected is elbows and knees. Because if you get a hard hit on the elbow or a knee, very painful, very damaging, uh, potentially puts you out of the fight. So the joints are very, very vulnerable. So it's kind of weird that they've left the elbows completely unprotected and there's no mail or chain mail there either. So they're vulnerable to cuts, thrusts, and even just being hit by a stick. One detail I do really like about the King's Guards though is that clearly there are some specific characters who I don't know yet because I haven't seen the first um, episode even, um, but the detailing and decoration on the sort of character's armor is far higher level, I think. It's been more detailed than the background King's Guards. And it does look really good. Um, it's uh, edging. We see this type of edging on lots of period armor, particularly English armor, actually. It was very popular in the 14th and 15th centuries to have decorated gilt brass borders um, on plate, on steel plate armor. So it looks really good, but uh, those elbows, <laughs> I wish they were more protected. They just look really weird when it's just fabric sticking out from between a pauldron and a van brace. Now, before I get onto the major characters, I just want to look at a couple of other soldier types that we see kind of in backgrounds, in fleeting glances, in the trailer and also in extra shots we've got from the set. So here we've got some um, soldiers who are in a sort of, I guess, equivalent to North African or Middle Eastern armor. And I actually don't have any big problems with how they're attired. We can see that they do have head protection. Yay! This was one of my major criticisms of the original series, and frankly, most movies set in a medieval technology world, is film directors hate to have their actors in helmets because they think it makes them harder to recognize or, or, or makes less value of their facial expressions and things like this. But the fact is that in a medieval world, if you can only afford one piece of armor, buy a helmet, okay? Helmet's super important. One hit on the head and that can be you dead. Um, so very, very important helmets and it's great that they've got head protection. In terms of what they're actually wearing, one of them has, in fact, a couple of them have got small spalders that they're called shoulder protections. They have torso fences which appear to be they look kind of leather but they might have plates underneath them we'd call this a coat of plates or it could potentially be something some form of uh, padded armor potentially but anyway it's a torso protection which is perfectly plausible and they're lightly equipped they're lightly armored and that's absolutely fine now, so briefly I'll just talk about this town guard that I believe are called the gold cloaks um, and as I understand it they are a town militia that Damon Targaryen who we'll get onto in a second Damon Targaryen uh, organizes, equips, and turns into essentially his personal bodyguard. Um, and their armor looks acceptable. Um, it's, it's basic plate armor. They've obviously gone for a look for it that looks more rugged and rustic and basic in technology and less fancy than the actual King's Guard. But this is essentially seems to be Damon Targaryen's own version of the King's Guard. They've got open face helmets um, of a fairly basic salad type. Um, and yeah, you know, pauldrons, breastplates, plate armor. Uh, gauntlets. It appears 
kind of fine. Um, I don't have any major criticism based on what I've seen so far. Now there's a scene with a bunch of knights in some type of uh, atrium or reception hall and I don't know the background because obviously I haven't seen the season yet, hasn't started, but this seems to be potentially suitors turning up to meet the princess or something like this. That's a guess anyway and that's the rumours on the internet. Um, but I love this scene because it shows a range of different armours and mostly they're pretty damned good from a distance. They, you know, you could slap some of these straight into a late Hundred Years War or Wars of the Roses period uh, documentary and it would kind of look okay, certainly from a distance. Now, if we get really nitpicky and we get close up, there are issues. The main issue here, like before, is there's a lack of mail underneath the plate. So what we see is the plate is just over padding. There's no mail at the armpits. There's no mail at the crotches, this kind of stuff. Plate armour, for the most part, certainly in, in the 15th century, is designed to work with mail filling the gaps. Otherwise, you just stab the knight in the armpit. Um, now, I should caveat that with the fact that there were occasions in history, in the 15th and 16th centuries, when mail wasn't worn under plate and there were times when people did leave off the, um, the mail underneath. I have done it myself as well in recreational uh, sort of reenactment purposes. And if we look at period art, 15th, 16th century art, we can see often the backs of the legs are not covered by mail and things like this. So it's not a massive criticism, it's just something maybe that might be interesting to some of you. But looking at, around at their armours, um, we can see one guy in what appears to be completely legitimate kind of 15th, mid 15th century plate with what appears to be either an armet or a close helmet. We can see someone with a great bassinet, yay, a great bassinet, um, with what appears to be a corazina or perhaps a coat of plates. Um, and uh, we see salads. Um, one thing I noticed about the salads, the, if we look at my salad here, you can see that the gap is fairly small for protective purposes. This helmet would, is intended to be worn with a lower half called a beva. Um, we don't see any bevers here uh, and the vision slits are rather wide, which is a common, what some of us would call a reenactorism, that's having a wider vision slit to allow easier vision. But if you look at the historical ones, they're often very thin slits. So I'd say, yeah, nitpicking the slits are too wide. But, you know, this is recognisable historical armour, which is great. There's salads, there's a great bassinet, there's an armour, or perhaps a close helmet. Um, and the plate armour looks OK. It looks pretty good. And they've got plumes and it all looks very fancy. So kind of squinting slightly and looking at this as kind of an impressionist view of late medieval knights in a hall. I think it looks great. So let's look at some of the main characters now. This is Corlys Velaryon, I think his uh, name is, and he is known as the Sea Snake, or Sea Serpent perhaps. And so he's one of the greatest admirals, seafarers of his day. And I really love the distinctive look that they've given him. It's uh, the armour is very particular. Now, given that he's supposed to be uh, an admiral of sorts, a, a, you know, a captain, there's nothing specifically which looks nautical about his armour, except if we look at his helmet here, you can see that he has a seahorse on it. So I love that detailing. And we could say that some of the detailing on his armour perhaps looks like fish scales as well. So I think overall, they've gone with an armour which um, fits very well with, for example, the, um, the King's Guard, but they have made it individual to him and incredibly detailed. Look at the amount of detail that's gone into the edging and the surface treatments of this armour. Now, um, he seems to be using a large axe or pole arm of some kind um, and his armour appears relatively light and he has an open-faced helmet. Now, just a brief comment about open-faced helmets. I have noticed that in the trailer and other material we've got, most of the helmets that we see on main characters are open face helmets. Now, you might think I'm about to criticise that. No, I'm not. <laughs> because the th fact is that open face helmets were worn a load, an absolute load in combat on foot. So historically, 15th, 16th centuries, even when people were wearing full plate armour all over their bodies, they would very often keep an open face because you can see, you can breathe, you can hear, you can talk, you can drink, all of these things much more easily. So yes, it means you're vulnerable and that's why helmets like this were invented because you could put the visor down and you'd have your bever up or you could just shield the lower part of the face like Batfink uh, if you were going in towards the enemy and arrow arrows were being shot your way and then as soon as you get into combat and pull your sword you've got face open you're fighting all around and your vision 
is very much a tangible defense. Okay, so being able to see is worth a lot in defensive terms rather than having that down. And now I've got a whole part of my face I can't see very, or a whole part of my vision I can't see very clearly out of. So open face helmets, absolutely fine. And I think it's great that they've got helmets where you can see the people have got a visor, but they've got the visor up when they're fighting. We'll look at one of those in a second. And in this case, it's just a pure open face helmet. No problem at all with that. I would say there's a tendency, as I've said before, for the pauldrons to be a little bit oversized in this series, as far as I can see. Um, but by and large, I don't have um, a, a big problem with that. My only real problem with um, Corliss's armor is that he, again, has exposed elbows. And this seems to be the costume here has done something that they thought, okay, we'll do pauldrons, we'll do van braces on the lower arms, and the elbows are completely uncovered by anything at all. It's just fabric, okay, which seems crazy to me because elbows just um, just get bashed on things all the time. If you do any type of training, you're forever bashing your elbows and things, skidding the elbows. So having elbow protection is in reality really important. If you're going to have any arm protection at all, covering your elbows is a good thing. So it's a shame that that's missing, but otherwise his armor looks fine and I love the detail on it, on it. Very briefly, we'll talk about Otto Hightower's armor. We don't see very much of it, but we do get a, get a glimpse of it. And actually it looks fairly decent. Um, it seems to have male, aka chainmail shirt with sleeves and a skirt that we can see, that's good. Then it appears to have what's called a placard. That's the plate that goes around the waist, around the midriff. Um, and it seems to have a fold attached to the bottom layer of it. Although notice that the fold is bending in a way that steel does not. So I suspect that what looks like a plate fold is actually made of rubber or something like that. And then he's holding a type of helmet that we would probably call a salat or a bar boot. Can't quite see the bottom edge of it, so it's difficult to say which. But again, an open face helmet, absolutely fine. And that uh, placard seems to be married with the upper half of what's either a covered, fabric covered breastplate, which was a thing, or possibly a brigandine, can't really tell from this image. But basically it looks like Otto Hightower's got absolutely fine armor that would be Mm, acceptable in a 15th century setting. So finally, we're gonna get onto that iconic Daemon Targaryen dragon-ish armor. However, just before we do, I want to talk about his opponent in the tournament because his opponent has a few interesting things about his armor that are worth mentioning. So I'm not certain what who his opponent is or who he's fighting, but there are some problems. <laughs> so his opponent using the um, red shield there with the spots on it, it, individually, the parts of armor appear fine. You know, he's got full plate defenses with elbow armor, hooray. Um, he's got a full cuirass, as we call it, that is a breastplate and a backplate with a fold, that's the skirt of plates, with tassets. They're the two kind of um, plates shaped like, a bit like tiles that hang down from the bottom of the fold. Um, and he's got leg, leg armor and he's got a form of developed bassinet, kind of a proto great bassinet. Uh, and there are certain things at first sight, that's fine, he's fully plated, he's got his visor up, I like that detail, he's fighting on foot with his visor up, because um, you can see better, you can breathe better, no problems there. But the armor doesn't fit him at all and is put together really shoddily. So the first thing to note is that it seems to have just been put on over clothes. When we put plate armor on, we wear what's called an arming doublet. You wear hose, which are very tight fitting uh, trousers, if you want to call them that. Um, and sometimes they're arming hose. And then there's male elements that go on. That is chainmail elements that go on like a chainmail skirt, sometimes male at the back of your leg your knees, inside of the elbows, armpits, and you wear a male collar. We don't see any of that here because obviously that's expensive and time consuming, it's difficult to fit. And so the costumiers have skipped that step out and they've just thrown the plate armor onto a clothed person with some issues. First of all, we can see the clothes quite messily sticking out of the bottom of the plate armor, which we shouldn't really be able to see. Um, which means that although he's wearing plate armor, anybody with a sword or a dagger can stab him in any number of places. Look at that crotch, look at that crotch. Completely, there's nothing in front of it at all. It should have at least male skirt, sometimes a double layered male skirt, sometimes what are called male brayettes, which are essentially like boxer shorts or shorts made of male, chain male and then with the skirt over the top as well in some cases. But here the leg armor doesn't seem to fit. It seems to be too short for him. So the leg armor stops well short of the cuirass, which means that there's a big gaping gap at his crotch, his butt, his hips, 
These are very important areas full of lots of major arteries that a person can be dead very quickly from getting cut or stabbed in. And notice how the, ar the leg armour is gaping away from his thighs. It should be sitting close to his thighs, strapped tightly around it, and pointed or attached to the bottom edge of the arming doublet, which isn't there because they're not wearing one. So there are all sorts of problems here. The arm armour doesn't look too bad. It's, it seems to be fairly closely fitting, and as mentioned, it Elite has elbow defences. The pauldrons look okay. The helmet is okay, actually. I don't have any major um, complaints about the helmet, but all of the people in this show seem to have exposed necks. They're not even wearing a male collar. So normally if I'm wearing this helmet with armour, even if I'm not wearing my plate bever, I wear a male or chainmail collar that comes far up here. One cut here and you can bleed out within seconds, literally seconds, one cut. So it doesn't matter how much armour you've got here and here, if this is completely exposed you're very vulnerable. That's why male collars were very commonly worn. And even if you don't have a male collar, a fabric collar coming up very high. The necks are very vulnerable here. So, um, his opponent in the tournament really poorly equipped. I would say the armour itself is not terrible, but it doesn't fit him and it's been terribly mounted on him. So finally on to Damon Targaryen's armour, who I expect if you're watching this video, this is the armour you want to know my view on. Well, first of all, overall, I think it's awesome, okay? It looks great. And let's face it, a lot of shows like this, it's not necessarily about how historically accurate is the armour, how well does the armour actually work in real combat, because that's it's not a documentary, it's not being used for that, it's fantasy armour. And this, to me, has a brilliant look to it, but partly because it borrows a lot from actual historical armour. It's very clear that the people that designed these armours actually went and studied real armour in books, potentially in museums, and spoke to armour experts. So, let's deal with his cuirass or breastplate first, which is obviously attached to a backplate as well. This at first might appear to be a completely fantasy design with these articulations, but it's not, okay? This is, a, this is very closely related to what we see at the end of the 15th and into the 16th century is what's sometimes described as he, um, heroic armour or, um, should we say, um, a la Romana or classical armour. That is the Renaissance. Okay, so when the Renaissance was born, Renaissance means rebirth. And what it was, was at the later part of the Middle Ages, the, there was the rebirth of interest in, cla in the classical world. That is Greeks and Romans for most of you. Okay, and so they started to sometimes make armour for tournaments, and remember this is a tournament, uh, particularly for tournaments, they started to make armour look like their imagined fantasy versions of these heroic Greeks and Romans that they'd read about in their mythological and legendary books, their history books. So, you know, they were trying to look like um, Achilles, or they were trying to look like Hercules, or any of these great heroes um, of, you know, Troy, or these, or, or the classical world, like Roman, uh, like Julius Caesar, or one of the Roman emperors. So, this is part of that tradition, and it, it does have some similarity to some historical armors that actually survived from that period. The helmet as well. The helmet is sculpted with dragon wings and a dragon head, and this is not dissimilar to some of the pageant and showing off helmets that we see, particularly in the early 16th century. Uh, one of the people who famously had helmets like this was Henry VIII of England, who fought tournaments. Uh, he was given a helmet by um, uh, Emperor Maximilian, I believe it was, uh, that has spectacles and, and horns on it and this kind of stuff. So they did absolutely have crazy helmets like this for showing off purposes. They may not be the normal helmet that you wear to war, but they did exist and they were particularly used in tournaments. The arm armour here is particularly well done. So the pauldrons are oversized, they're very big, but they are articulated and very, very detailed with fluting. And fluting is something we definitely see a lot of, particularly on German armour, sometimes on Flemish armour and often on English armour as well. So fluting, Gothic fluting most famously on German armour, absolutely a thing. And like corrugations, it makes the plates stronger and it helps direct things away from, weapons away from places you don't want them to go. So the arm armour here, it does have elbows. It, the gauntlets appear to be very well made. They appear to be German style gauntlets of about 1500 uh, in date. Um, there are some issues, however. It's not perfect. Okay, There's no mail that I have seen. The inside of his arms are only fabric covered. Now, 
in a tournament context, that was done sometimes. Sometimes they didn't bother with the mail. Um, and even in a battlefield context sometimes. So that's not a major criticism. It's just that we never see it in this series. I have never seen mail in any of the gaps of any of the plate armors here. Historically, sometimes, very often people wore mail in the gaps, and sometimes they didn't. In this series, in House of the Dragon, it appears that they never ever do, uh, which means they're very vulnerable in places like their armpits. If you know that nobody wears that stuff, then you can stab them there. But the major problem with his armour here, I think it's great overall, is this helmet choice for this activity. Choosing this helmet for a joust is crazy dangerous, crazy foolhardy. Jousting helmets usually use visors down, full face protection, fully enclosed. Because if you have a lance coming straight at you, even if it doesn't hit you in the face, if it hits you on the breastplate or the shield or whatever, bits of wood are going to break everywhere and you don't know what's going to end up in your face. So having an open face helmet for a joust is crazy foolhardy, but maybe that's part of him. And equally, if you look at his neck, he's got a, what we call a gorget, a plate around here, but his actual throat is exposed, which as we remember from, I think, the first episode of the first season of the original Game of Thrones series, having an exposed throat in the joust is a very bad idea. But overall, Damon's armour, I love the look of it. It actually has the look of real armour from the second half of the 15th century or into the 16th century. Um, and I love that. And they've managed to make it look fantasy as well. It doesn't just look like a, a replica of an actual historical armour. It looks like you've taken historical armour, which comes often out of uh, necessity of design, what works, and then they've applied some fantasy concepts and Game of Thrones um, sort of symbology onto the armour and made it work. And I think it looks fantastic, actually. For, for TV series or movie armour, this is setting the bar relatively high. It's not top level, but it's fairly good. So I don't want my criticisms to be taken um, badly there. I would like to see them improve on these in, uh, in future series, maybe, if we get more of them. Um, and, you know, I also recognise the limitations of a TV show. There's questions of budget. There's questions of what the actors can bear wearing for long periods of time. There's issues about being able to see their faces and expressions and for them to be able to move and do the things they need to do to play that character. So I completely understand all of those things. And we have to remember a lot of this armour probably isn't made of iron or steel, as it originally would have been. A lot of it's probably plastic, fiberglass, latex, all sorts of materials they will have used. So it will, for the most part, be lighter, but it will still be quite hot and possibly quite uncomfortable to wear um, for long periods of time for these actors. But overall, uh, Damon's armour, you know, given that he's one of the main characters who's going to be spending a lot of this show in armour, fantastic. They've, they've put where it was required. And do you know what? Don't underestimate how much work it was to get all of those extras looking right as well. They've got to look different from each other. They've got to have different style helmets. They've got to represent different types of things. Um, so I understand it's a complex uh, topic. Anyway, I will be looking more at the House of the Dragon as it goes on, and I'm sure I'll be making more Game of Thrones videos. So if you're interested in this kind of content, first of all, check out my previous Game of Thrones videos because I have a whole ton of them. If you look in my uh, movie and TV show fight review playlist, I've got tons of stuff in there from the past and I'm going to be doing more in the future. So if you're not subscribed, think about doing so because then you'll get notifications about similar videos to this coming up in the future. Give us a like if you found this interesting and I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.